think we'll get started. So um, today I'm going to actually be talking about some material that I've uh, covered in a little bit more depth in some of my past courses or trainings on agent-based modeling, but which um, I actually hadn't been planning to deliver today as, as part of this course. Um, uh, I thought I'd, I might leave it to later if we had time, but um, some questions during the last office hours on Tuesday um, kind of convinced me that I should probably move this material up and uh, and and try to do it do it due diligence, um, try to offer it due diligence uh, today. Um, partly because it's in my view, really important. Um, it helps solidify some of the topics we have discussed the past two lectures on, on networks, but it also kind of serves as a nice segue to the next major topic, which is spatial, incorporating spatial representation into models, um, representing geography or representing space more, more abstractly. Um, and the, the topic is, is one of network dynamics. Uh, it's one of networks that rather than being sort of fixed attributes uh, associated with each person and linking them together, sort of relational properties that don't change. Um, it's think of networks as part of an individual state, part of their situation, which evolves over time. Uh, now, uh, in many models, uh, we, we have static networks, but there are some very compelling reasons, very compelling um, motivations across a couple of spheres that motivate us to have a representation of networks for our models that are in fact changing over time. Um, and it's one of the choices to be made with agent-based modeling. If you're going to be representing relationships between people, if you're going to capture these relational attributes in the form of networks, do we do so statically in a fixed way or do, do we do so dynamically? And I'm hoping today's discussion, far from implying you should always engage in modeling of dynamic networks, will rather give you some, some understanding of some of the pros and some of the cons associated with dynamic networks. Um, some some reasons they might be uh, perhaps a bridge too far for for your model. Um, so today we're going to be talking about about network dynamics. Now, in order to do this, um, I've spent a, a, a bunch of time in the past few days pulling together um, some thought piece models that I think might stimulate thinking along these lines, but potentially give you some pointers for you know, ways you might represent certain factors uh, within your own modeling projects. And uh, we're gonna be making pretty heavy use of those example models, four of them, no less, together with any logic in today's session. So if you wanna call up any logic, um, uh, that would be great. And it would also help to call up the course site because there are four models there which we will be downloading in turn. Um, and we'll be weaving together as last time, as we did last time, uh, some discussion from slides on the one hand with use of those models on the other. And I think the models do a, do a decent first cut at first, you know, first, uh, first uh, um, job at, at sort of um, helping to illustrate some of the major topics I'm going to be speaking about within my slides. So uh, if it's okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, switch over here to my slides, um, but be going back and forth with AnyLogic. And to that end, I think I'll sort of drag AnyLogic down into this workspace so we don't have to switch workspaces in a frenetic way like we did last time. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And for those who don't have AnyLogic up, I'd ask you to pull it up. And um, we'll be, the first model we'll be grabbing is a model called 
minimalist network ABM model with network dynamics use a <laughs> any logic a v4 not not v3 v4 make sure you get v4 okay um we actually had a v3 up there before but if you went and got it you you should make sure you get the version four of it so it's the last four on the course site within this models for interactive use in course um and all of these have some nice new features so if anyone's browsed the library of models before you'll find some some new goodies in, in, in these ones, but this is the first one we'll be doing. Uh, the network ABM model with network, or the minimalist network ABM model with network dynamics. Okay. Um, now this is a model I put together for a, um, a boot camp in Sydney, Australia, at University of New South Wales back in 2013 originally, but uh, I gave it a, a real, a bit of a, a renovation uh, for, for, for um, uh, this class, uh, this session. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what this model shows first. Um, so I will make sure that it is loaded here. Yes, here we go. Okay, so if we open this model up, um, what we'll find is uh, that it includes a population, not surprisingly, uh, within that population, we're going to have people depicted with a rectangle around them. The rectangle around them, so the person is an anthropomorphic kind of image representing them. The rectangle around them is going to indicate uh, their health status. And in this case, it happens to be infection status. Uh, and if you go to person, you'll find that um, in an unsurprising and kind of potentially boring way now, they progress among four states in the natural history of infection. Um, and this should be quite familiar to us, but the idea is that initially they start susceptible, uh, they go on to expose, they have an infectious period and recovered. But I wanna emphasize from a network perspective, you know, what's going on is that the network is playing a key role in mediating some of these transitions. And particularly you may recall that we have this construct uh, in agent-based modeling called message passing. And in any logic, it's, it's most directly instantiated with a, a transition, say between states or a state and a conditional transition, a kind of flip the coin or, or a, you know, uncertainty, a decision point. It's indicated by a, a transition with this, um, with this little message or envelope on it. Um, and so when they get a certain message and the message is, is down here, it's exposure. Um, if, they, if this person is susceptible and another infective, as it turns out, sends them a message, they will, will go here. And then with a certain probability, um, they will remain susceptible. But the, the probability, the main probability of interest is the probability that having been exposed to fill in the blank, COVID-19, influenza, hep C or whatever, they go on to a, um, a with a certain probability, uh, the probability of transmission, they go on to the state of being infected, but not infective yet. So they, they would transition on with this probability um, to the exposed state. Otherwise, they remain susceptible. So if probability of transmission is 10%, 90% of the time, they're gonna go back to the susceptible state, right? Um, and uh, if they do transition on to expose, they will then go through a stage of completing latency. Um, you could see this transition is one of these rate transitions is described by hazard rate of 10% per day or 0.1 per day. So they'll remain in the state an average of 10 days. And then they go into an infectious state. Now in the infectious state is the other side of that, of that whole network mediation of, of infection. Because in the state periodically with a rate of one per day, um, they will be sending out a message to a randomly selected connection saying, hey, you're exposed. Um, now that person may not the, the person nearby them, this random connection who gets the message may not be in a susceptible state, in which case the message wouldn't make a difference. But if they are here, 
and they've received that message that again, that other person would have that chance of say 10% getting infected. So, so this here, the network is central to the interactions of agents as it is in many, many uh, agent-based models. Um, interactions between networks in this model are network mediated. And specifically the, the mechanism by which and they interact over that network. The network is the conduit, the particular mechanism by which they interact is sending messages. And that's what's occurring here, okay? Um, so just a reminder, um, networks play a very important role in capturing interactions between people, um, or between agents here. Um, and uh, that occurs in an environment whereby they are, are wired up to other people. Now, if we go to Maine, you may remember that in properties for Maine, if we have populations in Maine, their network assumptions are set in the, what's called the space and network area of Maine here. And if you scroll down, you'll find that it's, it's, it's not one of those built-in networks we explored last time. It's not a Poisson random network. It's not a small world. It's not a ring lattice. It's not a distance-based network or even a scale-free network. It's a user-defined network. And what that means is it's sort of a custom network. And we're going to see just how custom it is because we will be we'll be making and breaking connections over time. Um, it'll be a dynamic network. So let's run this model. And, and what I'd like you to run here is actually first this baseline with network dynamics. And that will be full of sound and fury but um, we're going to go in and explore uh, a little bit what's behind those um, those dynamics in just a bit. So I'm going to I'm going to run the model. It has 100 people in it, and those people, for visual parsability, they're located in a in a ring here. Um, and when I started it, I have one person who up here, in my case, happens to be in the upper left, who who has an orange background indicating that they were exposed. Now they've become infected. And, and this person up here in the upper left is infected. And in fact, one person who is connected to them, this one here has now gotten infected. And someone they're connected to across the, the pond is infected. And you can start to see the infection spread. And how does it spread? It spreads via these connections across, across this, um, uh, this landscape. Um, and, you know, a given person might be connected with several others. You can actually see how many people they're connected uh, to uh, written next to them. That initial uh, person, I think it was one of these, had either one or two. I, I, I don't remember which particular one it was, but it went to some others who have um, two or three connections in some cases or, or zero or one connections in others. And it's propagating around. Um, it's propagate around this network. But there's something different going on in this network that we did not see when we had those ring lattice networks or the small world network, which looked a bit like this. We had people in a ring and we had mostly local connections and some global. There's something else going on here. Can anyone say what it is? What is that thing that's happening here? an aspect of dynamics we didn't see when we looked at that small world network before. Anyone say? It's a very visible thing if you look for it. What's happening? Anyone? Yes, wait. People are making and breaking. Connections. People are making and breaking connections. So like this person over here, um, which uh, maybe I'll, I'll point it out here. This person, oh, they just lost their connection. And you know, any given person here will have connections being made and broken over time, okay? Um, and if we were to speed things up, we would see that you know, there's quite a bit of, of dynamics in that network. Now up here, we can kind of see over time, how the infection has spread. It actually went up initially. Maybe I'll start it again, and you can you can actually see it go up from the beginning. We started with, with zero people, and then one person became infective. That was the original seed person. 
and it's rising up and we see it spreading. Um, but then it actually starts going down to, to lower levels again. And this is the cumulative number up here, further up. We've gotten up to about 20, 21. And, uh, and we see actually it went up again and, and it's sort of moving around and, and keeps on climbing in the cumulative number here. Okay, um, it's propagating around this network. Any one person overwhelmingly has zero, one, two, there was one, three connected before, but they're connected with very few neighbors individually. But there is this breaking and making of connections. And partly because of that, we, we actually saw, you know, uh, out of the, you know, with 100 people in there, we saw 92 infections take place before the infection died out, even though each person only had zero, one, or two connections. And I want to explore this more because before we thought, well, if each person has very few connections, um, you know, it, it might really limit the spread of infection. Um, but in fact, it's it's spreading pretty pretty broadly. I'd, I'd like to now compare that with a corresponding static network. So this is a network with the same basic parameters, uh, the same assumptions about the probability of transmission, the number of um, people to whom uh, people are connected on average, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's with a, uh, a static network. So we're gonna run that, okay? Um, same basic assumptions, but the network won't be changing, okay? Um, so uh, here we go. Okay, so, so something is, is a bit different here because, um, pardon me, uh, okay, um, network dynamics enabled, imposed, uh, fixed degree. Okay, I'm. I think I'm going to modify this slightly so that we can do a apples to apples comparison. I'm not sure why it didn't there, but something went went wrong, and I'm just going to change one other thing. So here we go. The same basic situation, and uh, it's running and rises, and we get something like 96 people infected before. What did I do? I went and I changed baseline to say um, is imposing fixed degree. And it's one person on average that it is, well, one person is, is what it's shooting for um, on average for the number of connections. Um, and now we're going to go to the static network and do the same thing. Is imposing fixed degree will be on. And I'm going to run it. And now we're going to have the same basic setup, but it will be a fixed network. Could anyone tell me, how do you think this will affect it? So we still have most people having zero, one, two. Some people have, have two or three connections by accident and sort of if they've been selected by other people, but we have small numbers of connections. How do you think this will differ from the dynamic one? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? Compared to the dynamic one, if we have the network fixed compared to it being changing, do you think it'll make a difference? And if so, how? Anyone? Anyone want to read out if someone puts a message in the chat? How do you think it will differ? Anyone? Sorry? The rate of contact for a given person in terms of others that they affect uh, for a given person is one per day. They're going to be sending messages to, and it should be comparable number of people on average that they're connected to. Okay, so you're thinking that maybe it'll be less variable in its results, something like that. Okay, so that's a, a good idea. Others? Well, let's let's go see. Of course, these are what computers are really 
good at, right? Um, so we have it spreading here, and it is spreading. It's, it doesn't seem to be spreading quite as, as quickly. Um, if you kind of look what's going on, we, we have a bunch of people that got recovered there. And gosh, it only went up to nine, nine people, in fact, not 94 or something like that. Why do you think it didn't spread as much? Does anyone want to say? What, what do you think was different about this um, being static network, a fixed network, a network which isn't changing compared to a one that's shifting around? Why would that affect the cumulative number of people infected? You might think maybe it was a fluke. Maybe it, it just by chance didn't do that. But if we run it again, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll also see there's a good chance it will end up with a small number number connected. So this person is starting, they can pass it to either of these two people, for example, but once again, it's maxed out this time at about five connections. Why would that be? Why would it limit the spread so, so notably for infection? Does anyone wanna say? Anyone online? A static network, why would that make such a big difference compared to a dynamic network? Why is it so protective to have a static network? Wade. Well, I just wanted to draw your attention. Michael says the stochastic network connections created more opportunities to spread. Yes, the stochastic, I almost couldn't have put it better. That the stochastic network connections created more opportunities, more possibilities for, for spread. That's exactly right. They allowed a person to be connected, not just with the same two people over time, but a diversity of people, right? And different people at different times that could be exposed. And maybe on average, they affect the, the same number of persons if, if all the others are susceptible. But if one of those two people to whom they were normally connected in a fixed way is recovered, they can't spread it all to them. This way sort of lets them hedge the bet, spread it uh, amongst a bunch of different parties, even though their rate of spreading it is no stronger it spreads to a much broader diversity who each have connections to many different people. So it disseminates it, it diffuses it uh, more effectively. Let's go, if we could, let's go down to a, a small network that I think illustrates this even better. So down at the bottom, there's a tiny static dyadic target network. <laughs> okay, sorry, I got carried away last night. Tiny static dyadic network. So it's the last one here, target networks. So here's a static one, and we only have 10 people. And I'm going to pause it. I started it, and I, I paused it. And so we're going to start here with this person infected, and they're over, over here. Um, now, this is a static network. So you tell me, to whom can this infection spread over time? Who who is a possible eventual recipient of this infection? Who is it that can ever get infected? Or maybe maybe I'll ask, are, is there anyone on here who could, there's no way they could get infected by this person over the entire course of the infection? Is there anyone who's out of range of it? Who, who would that be? I see Wade sagely nodding. I can't read the label from here, but there's a, there's a triangle. On yes, this the one, <laughs> this one, and, and this one. These ones are in a different connected component. They're in a different area of the network as we're, an island in the network compared to this one. This one can spread to others in their island. It could spread to, for example, this one. It could spread to this one could spread to this one, this one, this one, and this one. But there ain't no way that it's gonna spread to any of these. Um, so for the Canadians in the audience, ain't no way means there isn't any way, sorry. Um, Michael would, would understand the Southern colloquial. So um, there's no way that these ones could be infected here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the ones that they could infect, it doesn't mean they will. You remember the case of the ring lattice network, we saw that if you have these sort of narrow paths to connection, 
they can easily become blocked. If, if maybe they infect this one here, what could happen that might block it from spreading here? What could happen here? Anyone? Well, they could infect this one, but this one could recover, right? And maybe they haven't infected any their neighbors and then there's no way it could spread to these. So if we if we start this out, we'll we'll see it, you know, playing out one scenario, right? Um, who's gonna be the person first infected by them? If anyone, oh, it's this person. Okay, um, time is going on. Now they've become infected and maybe they'll infect uh, these two. Maybe they'll infect this one up here. Maybe not. Can these ones infect this one up here directly? No, right? Because they're, um, they have to, the only one that can reach this is this one. So what we've seen is, you know, network uh, infection play out. And in this network, we had a total of seven people get infected. But those other three out of the 10 couldn't get infected. Static network. Now let's run a tiny dynamic network. Same basic population, same basic average numbers of connections. But here we're going to be changing the structure of this network over time, okay? Um, and, and now you can see this person has actually, who was infected originally, has infected uh, a, a set of different uh, people here that were located across the network. Uh, the cumulative number here for this particular instance wasn't that much bigger. It was, it was seven, in fact. But there's a lot more possibilities, which is what Michael emphasized, because a given person who's infected could be connected sometimes to one, sometimes to another, and it could end up making its way across the entire network. So I just ran that again, and here it infected in 12 instances, that doesn't mean 12 different people, I should emphasize, it, it means 12 infections occurred. Some people recovered and got infected more than once, but it spread across uh, much of the network here. And, and now, oh, they've become, they've become um, susceptible again, okay. Uh, so dynamic networks increase the potential, the opportunities, as Michael put it so eloquently, for connection. Um, it allows new connections to be, to be born. And it, you know, if you had time here, you could go run the dynamic dyadic compared to static dyadic and compare the numbers. But what you'll find in general is even without, even though a given person might have no more, no greater frequency of spreading, they, can reach a lot more people and therefore can spread to a lar much larger fraction of the network when you have um, network dynamics. And you know, uh, related to this, this point, the presence of a static network structure, a fixed and invariant network structure limits the spread of network contagion, right? It, it limits uh, to whom it can, it can spread. Um, it constrains the possibilities as to where contagion can spread. Um, with a static structure, you know, maybe it'll spread across a component, but it can't jump over to another component of the network, another island of the network, as it were. The presence of network dynamics, um, including, say, individuals who bridge sometimes to one island and sometimes to another, um, can lead to these, to these, you know, this ability for contagion to spread more broadly across the networks. Um, sometimes it can connect separate, what were separate components. It can add additional freedom and and sort of allowing it to spread to many different parties. Um, now, we have to recognize that that um, it's not as simple a di uh, a a matter dichotomously of, on the one hand, no dynamics and the other dynamics. The speed of the relative dynamics of the network change, how quickly that's occurring compared to the speed of say agent evolution, say how quickly someone recovers from infection, how long they stay infective to put it another way. 
determines if the network is kind of dynamic enough to really make a big difference in dynamics. If the network change is very, very slow to say recovery from infection, uh, maybe people only change partners once every year, but they recover from the flu in you know two weeks. Um, the impact of that dynamics on the spread is going to be quite limited. It's going to be, you know, you, you could be excused for just saying it's we'll treat it as a static network. Just like if you wanted to simulate a flu outbreak, you could be excused for having an aggregate model that leaves out births and leaves out um, leaves out immigration. Um, by contrast, if you have very rapid change in connections um, compared to the spread of, 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 or compared to how quickly someone evolves in terms of infection, you might have them infecting many, many people. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it bears noting that there's, it's kind of the relative rates of these things. It's not just is it dynamic at all or is it not dynamic? It's how dynamic is it relative to the to the network? Um, it does. It it is worth noting, um, just because you'll sometimes see comments on this in the social network analysis literature, that you know because of network dynamics switching of partners, you can see infection going, for example, from A to B without from without A and B ever being connected directly. They could both be connected with C at different times. A first spreads infection to B. And then, then B disconnects from A and connects to C while they're still infected. And it infects, uh, it infects uh, that, that other person. And these two people, um, uh, in, infection spread from A to both of the others even though they never connected with one of them. Um, I'm not explaining that well, but the basic idea is at any one time, um, uh, it doesn't require two people to be connected for uh, those two people to have infection work from going from the first to the second through another person. Um, and uh, similarly, you can have networks where at any one time, there's two regions that are, are not connected but because there's a person who bridges between them, who travels between communities, for example, they can bring infection from one community to another. So at no one time, for example, might Lalosh and Saskatchewan's North be connected directly to LaRange. But if there's someone who goes between those communities who is infected, they might get infected in Lalosh and then bring the infection to LaRange. Um, in, in, in the North. Uh, and at any one time, they're connected with one community or the other, but they can transport that infection. Um, now, networks, the fact that networks are dynamic also makes a big difference for interventions. I'm gonna be giving lots of examples here, um, as I just did, related to quantitative outcomes of models. We just saw with a dynamic network, you can get much broader spread than with a static network. With no increase in the, in the speed of, of um, you know, uh, exposure from any one person, you can still get it diffusing much more broadly for reasons Michael referred to. But there's another reason we often put dynamics in networks besides you know, making the model more, more accurate or better able to capture the attack rate. Another reason is because we want to capture interventions. Um, and there's a really important class of interventions that foster that whose definition depends on network dynamics. Um, and, and often these are focused, and I'm trying to generalize here across many areas, uh, given some examples here. Um, but you know, often they try to encourage either encourage favorable connections or discourage adverse or risky ones. They try to promote someone being with others who will help them in some ways or support them, or they discourage them 
from spending time of others who could be risky connections, either because risk flowing from one way or the other. So examples here, of course, are, are things like isolation and quarantine measures. I mean, the ways those work, the, ways, the way those operate is by changing our network connections, right? If, we're, if we come down with COVID-19, we go into isolation, we limit our network connections. That's an aspect of network dynamics. We've changed our connection structure. If we're in quarantine, we've been exposed. We don't know whether we're infected or not. We go into quarantine and change our network connections. Needle exchange programs, in a way, reduce contacts, you know, needle sharing, if that we define needle sharing as, as the contact of interest. Um, they, they allow people to, instead of sharing needles, to use their own needles and therefore um, avoid, avoid those contacts. Um, participation in support groups in the physical activity area. The CDC in the US, the Centers for Disease Control, has classified a, a limited number of ev what they view as evidence-based interventions to reduce obesity. And one of them is support groups for people to engage in physical activities, you know, social support in the form of, say, walking groups. Um, and similar structures, of course, in place with mental health, for substance use, you know, quitting. Um, uh, use of a certain drug or, or dealing with addictions, alcohol addiction. Support groups are, you know, a, an absolutely central feature of how we intervene effectively and sustainably. And that's about building networks, right? It's about connecting you with others who will be pro-social companions and encourage you in, in, in positive ways. And accountability partners, like you'll see across different areas of health, are, are similar. They they encourage people um, to stick to a certain plan because they know that that otherwise they'll be called out for it or or held accountable by a partner. Um, maybe they have to give them you know fifty dollars for every time they break their promise to to um, you know uh, engage in some health behavior or whatever it is. Um, safe activities for youth, you know, um, providing youth. Uh, uh, youth activities or or uh, safe spaces can reduce gang involvement. You know, uh, participation in supervised consumption sites encouraging that. So so people are engaging in a, a network context where it's safer because people could spot someone who's who's at risk of overdosing or para consumption. And even you know across the agent type barrier, classes of agents support animals, right? Um, uh, animals that. That provide support, whether it's service, highly trained service dogs, or, or you know, other animals that provide emotional emotional support. Um, so, so when we think about network dynamics, one of the reasons we incorporate it is because it really matters for, you know, the observed dynamics, the, the sort of impact of things. But another reason is. We need to characterize these interventions we care about and incorporating, we, we can't incorporate them without characterizing change in networks, um, very common. So what are some common drivers for network dynamics other than, than, than interventions? Well, you know, if we, if we look at why networks change in the world, there's a lot of different reasons. One is an open population. People are coming into the population. People are leaving the population. And, you know, the networks change accordingly. The population members, you know, um, are removed. Um, they graduate. Um, they might, you know, pass away or be hospitalized, and that changes network. Perhaps, um, you know, they are put into um, community community cohorting facilities for quarantine and, and removed from their household, for example. Um, so you have an open population, a population where the, the people represented changes. Another one is change in relationships or partnerships. So with sexual networks, change in partnerships is central. Um, you know, people change partners over time and, um, and that can induce changes in the network, um, who they're connected with in a network that can be really important for spread of things like sexually transmitted infections or HIV, AIDS or, or um, HPV, et cetera. Um, 
there could be agent behavior that shapes network connections, you know, agents seeking out seeking out others uh, to provide social support, for example, or seeking service, you know, seeking, seeking service, healthcare, you know, health, um, uh, healthcare seeking, um, or trying to accumulate social capital. So, you know, intentional uh, behavior on the part of agents is quite common for people. Um, um, many people respond to stress by seeking out companionship or seeking out support groups, et cetera. Um, uh, and it's common for organizations that might be represented as agents, uh, organizations that try to engage in, in networking to find, you know, complementary business partners or what have you. And then finally, changes in location or surroundings often induce network dynamics. So when we change the surroundings we're in, um, so to... To, to show some of these, I'd like to open up this model called communicable mobility version three with networks, no less, with networks. Be sure to, sure to download the one with networks. Um, there's a version of this without networks. It actually doesn't, it doesn't have to be done with networks, but I, I think it's uh, rather evocative with networks. So here we go. So, so download it from the site. I've got it up right here. And we're going to be exploring uh, some scenarios with it. Uh, for this one, uh, we're going to be going successively through each of these scenarios. Okay. Um, so we're going to start, ladies and gentlemen. So by just take a look at at this. So so this is a model which involves guess what? Susceptible infectious recovered and and. There's this contact going on and it sends a message periodically in, in the way you should be getting used to. But then agents are in motion here. And this is where it starts getting a bit closer to the topics we'll be getting to starting next lecture. Topics associated with space and mobility, et cetera. Um, and these persons, which are represented in a rather stylized way by a, a circle, um, they're well-rounded individuals, um, they are placed in a population, okay? And uh, with a certain population size. And, and there'll be a, a little graph up top I stuck in last night so you can see the, uh, the number infected. We're gonna start with the large population. Here we go. Um, and we're going to, to run it. And this one is, is, is always a little bit fun for me to run. Um, so here we go. And it's kind of in slow-mo right now. Um, we can speed it up a bit, but um, it actually depends a fair bit on the speed of your computer or what else it's running. Um, but here we see these agents moving around. They're actually moving around in a fairly entropic way according to a, a random walk. Agents color denotes their infection status. And you'll notice that there are these little network connections that are formed. And it's the presence of those network connections that allows infection to spread. So we have, when a, when a red one connects to a green here, uh, it can lead to transmission of infection and then it can propagate within those networks. So here we have infection sort of spreading out within a space as people come into contact. Now, for those whose interest lies outside the pathogen area, I'd ask you to think some about spread of ideas or spread of innovation or spread of knowledge or attitudes or beliefs, you know, spread of rumors or conspiracy theories. And um, those two might, might spread out where there's susceptible people, I haven't heard it yet. There's people who are currently infected by it, believe this, lack of conspiracy theory or whatever. And then there's people that are recovered by it, uh, from it, and who, you know, they've heard it before, they've been there, they've done that, and they, you know, it, it clearly seems to be not happening. And so they, they are now recovered and, and um, can't be infected again. But here we see it kind of diffusing through, and it hasn't spread to everyone yet. Um, there's there's still people further out that have not yet gotten infected, and um, 
which may remain uninfected despite brief encounters. So here we have mobility shaping networks. And this relates to my, my last comment that changes in locations or surroundings, um, mobility among locations can affect network structure. You could have network structure that is spatially localized. Not all networks are spatially local. You know, your Facebook network is not fully localized spatially. Um, uh, the networks that you maintain perhaps for um, uh, online gaming, they're not going to be, uh, you know, geographically lo localized. But there are a lot of networks with, for certain types of contacts, certain types of connections of interest that are certainly spatially spatially localized. So let's go to a medium population. Well, I should have I should have actually looked at that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was neglectful. I got carried away by the uh, the, the sheer joy of, of looking at this. Um, joy or hard, depending if you think getting infected is a is a very bad thing or a good thing. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm going to run this again and at some cost in terms of uh, take you a bit of time. We'll see how the infection spreads. Um, I'll do it for the first 20 or so minutes. Now you notice it's rising quickly. Can anyone say why is it right? Why does it start slow, but then start rising more quickly? Does anyone want to say? Can anyone describe like why, why would its rate of increase be going up over time? Why is it going up more steeply here than, than at first? Anyone? Why would it be going up faster after the first little bit, it starts to go up faster and faster yet, et cetera. Why would that be? It's spreading out spatially to sort of larger and larger areas. There's more agents diffusing it. And so we get up to about 225 or so by time 20. Um, as, as pleasant as it is to contemplate, I think I'll stop it. I just went back into any logic in this console and killed it. You could also kill it through a button up here or, or, or just close the window. I'm gonna try medium population now. Now this is a population of 200 instead of the last one was 500. So this one's gonna be uh, less dense. It's gonna be faster to simulate. And here we have some people starting infected. Okay. Um, uh oh, look at that. Look at that. Um, uh, is, it, is it going to spread? What do you think? There's one, one infective. Yeah. Oh, there it went. Okay. So, um, but both of them ended up recovering. And basically, it, by time 20, it was at two, right? Not 225, two. Two. Stinking one's got infected. Let's let's try that again. You could say, well, it's, you know, bum luck, but um, let's 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 try this again here, right? Oh 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 oh, look at that. Um, okay, um, okay, um, that, that green one is very lucky. Um, okay, and if you go up and you take a look at it by time twenty. There was still only one person infected. Um, and we'll try it one more time um, and, and see how much, get a sense of how much variability is. Okay, now this one, it started a little bit more centrally, right? Um, and by time 20, it's, it's risen up quite far, but only up to about 60 or so. It's a lot lower than the 225, but it illustrates variability between connections, right? Why did this one have less spread um, than that original one? What was it about that original one that allowed it to spread to so many more by, by time 20? Anyone? Well, at a larger population, clearly. But was that all? There was something else going on, right? What else? came with a larger population, a larger what? 
density. Exactly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is our density. Um, so it's our, it's our, it's our, um, it's a key factor that is governing this is the density, the density of the network um, or the density of those connections determines how many connections they, or the density of the, the individuals determines the density of the connections, which determines opportunities to spread in this dynamic network. Um, now you notice that there's an emergent structure that kind of comes out of this over time, this long tail. Um, it's in fact still, still decreasing. Um, uh, and there's a, a bigger story here about mobility that I'm going to go into right here. But this is a case where we have um, network connections that are dictated, which evolve based on location and mobility. Um, uh, they, are, they are affected by the mobility of the agents. Um, and that's what's driving the network dynamics. Okay, um, so let's go to a, another model. We're, we're having such fun, I hope. Um, let's go to the model called hierarchical infection transmission V9, any logic eight. Okay, um, okay. And hierarchical infection transmission V9, any logic eight. And for those, you know, seeking to make, is that it's the second to last one here, okay? There we go. Um, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get that loaded up. Um, and those who are in my boot camp may remember us building a model just uh, like this. My August boot camp, we built this uh, model together. Um, but uh, in this model, it's actually a close variant of this. I, I don't think it was the exact model, but I could be wrong. Um, okay, so here we have an illustration of a, a nice element of the repertoire of agent-based models. We have um, the main overall environment, but within the overall environment, it's not a population of people like it was for the last two models, but a population, no, of cities, of cities. And these cities, there'll be a certain account of them and within each city will be in turn a population of people. And cities have dynamics associated with them induced by the population within them, but also they can perform interventions. And, and those from the boot camp may, may remember that. Um, so we have within each city a population of people. The cities differ in their populations. Um, and this population of people within a city Within each city, the people are arranged within a distance-based network. So they're arranged sort of spatially locally. They're connected with other people within a certain distance of each other, a transmissibility range. But within the overall, the overall situation within Maine, we have um, the cities being connected also in a distance-based network. Okay. Um, they're connected together, say, with road or rail connections. And each person here within one of those cities um, uh, goes, you know, evolves according to an SIRS model to structure and basic design should be familiar. Um, but what's notable here is that periodically individuals here migrate, they migrate to different cities. They get they, they get a city that is directly connected with their city and they move to said city. Uh, and they critically, they knit themselves, the person who's moved to that city knits themselves into the network of their new neighbors in the new city. So they move to a city, another city, and they, they fit into the network, which will then allow them to do what? In that new city, they'll be able, by virtue of being in the network, what will they be able to do? If this person who's moved is infective, they'll be able to do what in the new network? 
if this person who moved to this other city is infective, what can happen in their new environment when they're knit into the network? They could do what there? What nasty thing could they do? Spread the infection. Spread the infection. Well spoken. Well spoken. So let's let's go let's go check it out. So we're gonna run the baseline here, um, and uh, I'm sorry. I'm 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 I'm, I'm bad. We're, we're actually gonna go to the small cities frequent migration because it will illustrate it better. Um, all for you, ladies and gentlemen, all for you. Okay, so it's the last, last experiment. I'm sorry here, um, but I, I, I built that, that one for this class to, to illustrate some principles. So if we run it, what we're gonna see, and I'll pause it here is, is um, we see people in, in a network and one person has started exposed. That's, that's the yellow here. Um, and they're knit into a network. And uh, within that network, um, they're connected you know, to a certain number of other people to whom they could spread infection when they become infectious. But another thing that can happen here is, is movement between these cities. And in fact, if you look over time, you'll see like one of that person's connections move to a different city. And that range, that allows something to happen that otherwise wouldn't be the case. The fact that people can move between cities can allow what to happen. It actually didn't happen here. Um, it hasn't happened here yet. The only people who moved between cities were recovered people. But what could happen in a model like this where we have people that go through stages of infection and can move? This one also didn't didn't happen to happen before it uh, and when I'll try another one. Here we go. Okay. Um, what can happen? Anyone? Mm. Also didn't 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 happen here. Well well then ah uh, there we go. Okay, what happened here that's different? Yeah, they bring, go to another city and they spread disease among in that city. And here what you could see is the actual spread of disease occurred in multiple cities. It occurred here, it occurred here, it occurred here. And in fact, it's occurring here as we speak and it's occurring down here. So, so ladies and gentlemen, um, here's another case of people moving to a new venue and forming networks in that new venue and being affected by or here uh, affecting others in that network because they are in fact, but if someone here was susceptible, moved to another city as is susceptible, they could of course be infected in that new city as well. So ladies and gentlemen, here we have this interaction of mobility amongst environments, shaping connections, network connections, which expose people to different environments. And you might model, you might imagine a model where you have people in a population being incarcerated and they're in a new environment. They have new connections that form in the incarceration facility, um, uh, some of which might be more ultimately pro-social, some pro-criminal, and then they go back to their original city you know, the original environment and it may, that experience may have affected their behavior. Those continued network connections are ones that they have in the community, which may be, uh, positive or adverse, depending on the circumstances. So, so here, you know, network dynamics can be driven by location. Um, and this is, this model is another illustration of it. It also illustrates a feature that wouldn't have come without it, which is infection can spread between cities. If we had no migration going on, uh, the infection could never spread like this from here to here, here to here, here to here. Um, it, it just wouldn't be able to spread. And I think it spread up here. There's no way it would be able to spread. People would get infected and recover in their own city and the infection would burn out in their own city. Um, to, um, to make this point a little bit clearer, I'm going to right click on this and say, copy this exact experiment. I'm gonna come up here. And I'm going to say paste, boom. And I'm going to say, 
no migration, no migration, instead of frequent migration, no migration, boom. Um, there we go. Small cities, no migration. And I'm going to change the migration rate to be zero. There we go. The assumption about the migration rate, I'm going to change for this scenario. I'm going to run the same model with an alternative assumption, namely that the migration rate is zero for the small cities, no migration. How did I do that? I right clicked here. I did copy. I went up here and I did I selected right click and I did paste. On on Max, the right click is instead. And Wade, could you fill it in again? Control click. Could, control click if if they lack uh, something. Well, yeah, you you can you can use a mouse single button on a Mac to support it right click. I see. Right click is bed supported. Um, you can just yeah. say right click. Okay, I could say, th thank you, I've been, been liberated. Um, that's great. Um, when I think of Max, I still a lot think of the 128K um, <laughs> Mac with a single button. Um, I remember remember that from 1986. Okay, um, great. Um, so network dynamics can be driven by mobility. We've seen that in the last two. And I'm going to show you, um, I think, one more one more illustration of this. Um, and it's going to be motivated by people's movement within communities. Um, we've actually done in my group a lot of work and contributed quite a few methods used worldwide um, for looking at patterns of network connections and or mobility. Um, using smartphone-based data collection. So using our Ethica, uh, Ethica Health uh, System, um, which uh, came out of my lab and a neighboring lab here, um, and uh, which is a popular smartphone-based data collection system that includes sophisticated surveys, as well as um, uh, you can enable or disable dozens of sensors on a per configuration basis for a given study. It can use no sensors or lots of sensors, et cetera. This is a HIPAA compliant app. And, and one of the earlier uses of this in, in our communities was to look at context studies. It actually, the project originated in the 2009-2010 flu pandemic, the, the H1N1 flu pandemic. Um, and we looked at contact patterns and health outcomes in that pandemic and published on it. Um, but another thing we did uh, with our early on with our smartphone based version of this study of this system was to look at contact patterns for participants at different times um, uh, during working hours, for example, versus after working hours. And so this is a participant that, you know, during the day, this is pre pandemic, this is pre, pre COVID 19 pandemic. Hey, Students out there, come on back to the lab. It's it's it, the water's warm, it's friendly. Um, so here we go. Here's our um, here's our uh, situation during working hours. They're actually at the lab. Can you believe it? And then uh, after working hours, um, they're at homes. Um, uh, a lot of them, not not all of them, are are at the lab for sure, as it should be. Uh, they're at home. Um, so here they are at their homes, and they they alternate between these. This is their overall pattern um, of of, um, of of where people are, but um, these are contacts where they're having contacts with others. But uh, during the day, they want tend to be one place. Uh, during uh, uh, after working hours, in other places. This is another participant um, uh, who you know during the day is also tends to be on campus. And out of working hours, they tend to spend a lot of time down here, but also uh, time over in this region, uh, presumably because of friends and that and living in what looks to be Sutherland. Um, so the point is like, if we look at a contact network where their contacts are occurring and so on as a whole, we'll find that, you know, we have one network structure, but if we look at it temporarily, we'll find it's a different, um, you know, it, it's different. This was from our first study with the uh, 
COVID with the H1N1 pandemic. And you know, week one, for example, um, we have four being a, a highly connected uh, individual with lots of others, two and nine and 33 connected. In week two, um, we, we get a somewhat different picture of the situation. Um, I'm not sure where, where uh, four went, but uh, 33 is up here and is still connected quite a bit with two um, and a little bit with 37, but their, their connections uh, to nine, for example, are, uh, are, are, well, two and nine, yeah, are, are connected here, but 33 and nine less so than uh, was seen, seen here, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's fair to say. Um, so contacts evolve. There's dynamics, and those dynamics play out often in communities. So let's, let's go look at a model, kind of fun model, that has people moving between different sites and communities. And uh, although it's not explicitly um, needed, um, you can imagine those networks forming and reforming. So this is something called, I have it loaded, SIR Institutional Mobility V2. There we are. It's the very last one. Okay. So here, we're going to have people circulating in a community. And um, they're going to be at home sometimes. They're going to be at work. They're going to be at random community locations. Kids will be in school, um, but then be you know out in the community or at home, et cetera. And we'll, we'll see this. Um, and the visual size of certain of the elements will indicate how many people are there and by implications are linked in a network there um, or, or would be linked in a network there. Okay, so uh, here we are, SIR agent-based mobility. We see that it represents, uh, excuse me, um, uh, persons and guess what? The persons have a here SIR type model, um, but they, they can either be at home, at an institution, or engaged in outside activities amongst different locations. Um, and, uh, and they move um, here between, between those locations. And so, for example, when they first come home, they jump to the location of their home. Thereafter, if they go to an institution, they'll transition locations and they'll jump to the new place to which they are headed, whither they go. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of stuff going on here. Let's let's run the model. I think it'll become more obvious. So uh, I I ran the bluntly named simulation, and uh, what we see is a set of homes, and I'm going to. I'm going to pause it for a moment while I narrate. So we have homes, those are the larger ones. And, and the reason they're so much larger than the other icons is not because they are palatial mansions. It is because there are people there and it, it actually enlarges it to show, oh, there's a lot of people there. But you'll notice that there are um, uh, a set of other locations. They're, they're community locations, which as I recall are, are shown in, in green here, um, the miscellaneous places, if you double click, um, there are schools, which are shown as, as being in sort of this color, uh, and there are workplaces, factories, in this case, uh, iconic, iconically. Um, and there's kind of a, a generic uh, institution which which sort of captures a lot of the, the logic uh, for many of them. There's some finesse with this model. Um, so we're gonna run this model and what we'll see is dynamics is induced. You know, where people are will change. So now a lot of people are at workplaces and some are at school. Some should be at schools. I actually don't see schools moving that much. Um, okay, now they're out in the community. <laughs> they're moving around in the community. Um, and uh, these little rectangles under the um, under a given one of these is indicating how many of the people who are there, how many are sick. So like this is a home here with very few people sick. This is a home that's very ill. Um, and, uh, 
and and now they're out in the community and spreading it in the community and they're moving back and forth between these and school children seem to be in shortage here and i'm gonna have to figure out why that is anyway um the point is they move between these environments um and they move home to uh, workplaces to community locations where they mix more entropically and then back home or for kids that move to the schools so this this too is an aspect of mobility and if it reminds you of those graphs from what we showed here where they're predominantly at a workplace during the day and predominantly at home in the evenings it is good with, with good reason yeah um so here we have we have contacts um, taking place in different places during the day, and that shapes their network connections. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about this before we we close. Um, so um, when we speak about network dynamics, an important consideration is that. Um, that often it is traditionally it's hard to collect data on network dynamics. Um, getting network structure can itself be challenging. Getting network structure, characterizing how a network changes over time can be more challenging yet. Um, and, uh, and yet how we connect, collect data um, uh, on networks often has a fundamental impact on our temporal res resolution, our ability to, to, to resolve, you know, what are the contacts at one time versus another. Um, so if I skip forward a slide, um, uh, for example, for a TV contact network, this, um, this is from our provincial TV control program whose efforts we contributed to over many years. Um, TV is a one of those uh, uh, diseases of very high burden in, in uh, some of the most vulnerable communities and disease I, I care about greatly and, and um, have done a great deal of modeling with. Um, uh, and we used uh, the case contact network. Um, the contact network resulted from contact tracing, this emergent network, and sort of diagrammed it out into groups. And these clusters, it turns out, were by and large associated with different communities. Some of them, like these two, were in the same community, but less, less tightly connected groups within the community. One might be immigrants, and one might be groups with, with stronger um, uh, TB linkages to indigenous areas, for example. Um, uh, but uh, these, these broadly, differently colored uh, components tended to be from different communities. Um, and some individuals would bridge communities, might move from one community to another, for example. Um, now, um, this network was connected or was collected um, by contact tracing over 10 or more years. Um, an individual connection on this network was based on being in two people being in their presence for at least 10 hours over a given month. So there's nothing about the definition of the contact that means this whole network can't resolve faster, you know, contacts like on a month basis or a week basis. It's really the fact that we group together data over, over 10 years. Um, but many networks are only characterized statically, traditionally. And we're in a somewhat different era now for this. Um, this network was connect, uh, collected over the 80s and 90s. Um, these days, you know, there's a new uh, surge in awareness of dynamic networks through the availability of big data and electronic uh, data collection. And it provides these opportunities for, for measuring network structure at higher temporal resolution. And it's not something you always do by any means, but several of my students, uh, Winchell here and, and the current CEO of, of Ethica Data, Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Hashemian, have done tremendous amounts of work um, in this area with Winchell having a particular deep uh, look at the connection with agent-based modeling, but, but Mohammed doing some of the same as well. 
And you know, this is not a point I'm going to go into in um, tremendous detail, but you know, if we're dealing with network dynamics, we should be aware that there are these technologies um, packed into normal smartphones, which um, enable for consenting individuals um, to, to participate in studies which look at dynamics of contact patterns over time, look at disparities in contact networks, disparities in crowding, et cetera. Um, so if we have an individual who's who's of, of concern here, um, there's two primary ways you can, you can derive network structure for them, that network structure changes over time. One is through what's called Bluetooth beaconing, and that's using Bluetooth, which is a connection for, you know, traditionally used for printing or for going with your headphones, for pairing with your headphones or, or pairing with other consumer electronic devices. For consenting individuals um, in a study, you can keep track of their connections with each other. Um, and you can do so with what are called beacons to keep track of their interactions with, say, service dogs or, or lo particular locations of interest or a pill cart in a long-term care facility or what have you, um, the nurse's desk. Um, uh, another way is through what's called GPS, through GPS co-locating, and and here you know we're looking for several individuals what their GPS position is, and we, you know, we treat someone as co-located, someone as connected, if they're at basically the same GPS location. Um, each of these has limitations. GPS can be particularly problematic indoor environments uh, in large buildings, specifically. Uh, it's, it tends to be fine for houses or, or small, small facilities, but in, in large buildings, like the one in which I'm, I'm delivering this, this talk, um, it, uh, it can be hard to get good GPS signal. Bluetooth positioning tends to give much more fine-grained approach. And Winchell here has uh, a whole doctoral dissertation exploring this and, and looking at um, you know, the implications of measuring networks with GPS and Bluetooth with different levels of frequency. And the results are, are really quite, quite interesting. Um, a key role here is played by agent-based models. So we, we kind of measure the data in different ways and we feed it into models and we compare the outcomes, what we would get with the full data with data that's only collected less frequently or was collected with a different modality. So we compare that with the most detailed picture we have of the networks. And I won't go into this in any sort of detail, but suffice it to say that there are sizable differences for what you see with certain infections spreading on networks when you consider them fully aggregate, just fixed static networks, um, even if they're weighted networks versus if you're characterizing how the network evolves over time. You characterize A connects to B and only later B connects to C, et cetera, versus if you just treat them as being continuously collected, connected with a certain weight. It turns out there's, there's real big differences. Um, and uh, this was work with uh, Mohammed Hashemian here, but um, uh, also with Winchell uh, involved. And uh, you know, if if we compare um, the impacts of of looking over time at, at networks evolving versus kind of using a, a a specific day as sort of representative or emblematic, there are some big differences too. There's just so much variability between days. Um, so um, I'm not trying to to you know push these sort of methods, but you should realize that when it comes to the dynamics of networks with the rise of these two technologies, Bluetooth, GPS, with the rise of sophisticated data collection systems like, like the Ethica Health system, we can actually do studies of network dynamics that can clue us in better to how network dynamics play a role in, um, in health um, and in shaping health connections. Rarely do studies right now have recourse to that sort of data, but a growing number do, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's issues having to do with um, you know, schizophrenia, for example, or depression, 
or senses of eudaimonic, hedonic well-being, uh, or whether it's a spread of pathogen um, or spread of perception of risk. Um, increasingly, we can go beyond static networks and look at networks which, uh, which do change over time and, and understand how that, how that ends up impacting um, the results we see. So just looping this back in to um, the broad arc of this presentation, we've talked about network dynamics, not as um, uh, a sort of side matter, but as actually quite central for characterizing certain phenomena within real world systems. And uh, there are cases where the presence of network dynamics qualitatively changes what we see. It prevents an infection from going extinct uh, versus um, you know, keeping it alive in the population endemically. And we've seen for interventions, uh, when you have interventions, a lot of them are geared around achieving change in networks. So when it comes to an agent-based model, um, that incorporates networks. Most have traditionally opted for static networks. And for most cases, that tends to be um, quite adequate. But you should think consciously, are there some aspects of the, the interventions you want to characterize or aspects of the dynamics that you're trying to capture where you'll miss the ball if you don't capture the potential for networks to evolve, okay? Um, and I've given you a couple big drivers for when you might really want to characterize that dynamics. If you have open populations changing the relationships and partners, like with STIs and sexual transmission or needle needle-borne transmission, um, intentional agent behavior and changes in location that might lead to differential spread, say at home during periods of lockdown or, or isolation, et cetera, or um, lead to uh, different patterns during school closures or school changes in school um, scheduling, like during quinting, et cetera. So um, a glimpse uh, of a broad area, uh, network dynamics are of strong interest for some models. And it's one of those choices to be made consciously when setting the scope of a model. Great. So um, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, thanks for your patience with this kind of diversion from uh, our next, uh, next lecture. But next lecture, we're diving into that area of spatial modeling. And we'll be getting soon enough another lecture or two beyond that into mobility, which we saw glimpses of today. Okay, thank you. And